The Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab episode 715 for Monday, June 25th, 2018. Yeah, greetings, folks, and welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, the show. It takes your questions, your tips, your cool stuff found, mixes it all together into a nice potpourri of uh, deliciously scented learning for your pleasure. Uh, sponsors for this episode include Other World Computing at MaxSales.com. We'll talk more about them in a moment. Crossover from Code Weavers, where you can get a 35% uh, discount and a 14-day free trial at CodeWeavers.com slash MGG and... A new sponsor, 1Password for Mac. Actually, 1Password for everything is the sponsor. 1Password.com slash GeekGab. It's a little different. I'm sorry for that. But it's worth it because you get three months for free. We'll talk more about that, too, here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Fearful, Connecticut, John F. Braun. How you doing today, Mr. John F. Braun? <sighs> I'm doing great, but uh, some of my drives are not happy, man. Uh oh, you, you knew you, it was going to happen. I, I so uh, are these? Th this is interesting to me. I'm, I'm, I'm stumbling a little because I'm trying to think of which gear to put the brain in this morning. But <laughs> what um, it, it, are these? Were these drives that that are failing? Were they purchased all at the same time or put into service all at the same time? No. Okay. No, this was um, so I got four drives in my uh, original Synology, two in the expansion uh, bay, and two in the unit itself. And the two that are in the primary unit, I got, and then later I got uh, an additional larger drive, and it was actually a WD refurb. But um, one thing you can do with a Synology is set um, a, the number of bad blocks. At which point, it tells you you have bad blocks on the drive, and right. Right. Like a week ago, it said, hey, you got one bad block and a disconnection event, uh, which I guess is it renegotiates or fixes it and says, yeah, everything's OK. Right. And all that happened. And I'm like, eh, all right, well, you know, one bad block, not, nothing to panic about. But then I got the alert again. And this time it said, yeah, by the way, you got 44 bad blocks on this drive. And I'm like, OK, time to get a new one. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, right. So it, the. Drives are interesting, right? Because th we're talking rotational drives. They once they develop, start developing bad blocks, that process does not end. It may, uh, it may happen slowly, and but you might see where it goes from. And I think you saw this with your drive. We were talking earlier this week when we were on the train down and back to Pepcom. But um, I think what you saw was your drive go from one bad block to zero. And yes. And that happens because your drive actually has some extra blocks that are unused, reserved blocks. And when it detects a bad block, it remaps things and stops using the block that's bad. Now, obviously, you know, you've got some, you know, it, it's like cancer for hard drives. Like it, it, it and, and, and there is no chemotherapy, right? So it's just, you know... Once it starts growing, it, it and, and and these are how these things go, right? It's uh, unlike cancer; it's it's something that happens just as part of the wear and tear of a drive. So uh, you need to, uh, you, you know, you just once once this starts, that is mm -hmm. the warning sign, and and that's one of the nice things about rotational drives is that they they tend to fail with warning, not always. Don't rely mm. on that. But generally speaking, they, you know, you tend to get some warning signs that it's that the drive's going uh, going south and you can do what you're doing. Right. It's like, oh, time to order a new one. You know, you take it offline, you put the new one in and it's good to go. But uh, with SSDs, of course, our experience has been no warning whatsoever. The drive just goes offline. And as far as the computer's con concerned, it has been removed. It's not there. No drive sensed, which is, you know, mm. anyway. Right. Yeah. So as soon as that happened, one thing you can do with the Synology, I basically said, well, let's uh, take that drive out of the they now call it a storage pool. And I'm right. like, yeah, let's deactivate that drive. 
So it basically removes it from the array. And then it's now saying, well, now I'm in degraded mode. Um, you know, I still work, you know, but I didn't want, you know, that drive to complicate matters because, you know, data is st starting to lose things. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. So I'm sure it recovered everything because, you know, I'm, I'm set up, you know, with re redundancy using their hybrid, but I have another drive of the same capacity on the way. Okay. Yeah. Wait, so Pop it in and then it should rebuild it or repair it, I guess. Yeah. Is it? Oh, so you have not told it to repair the array. You're, you're still in degraded mode. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So you don't have any redundancy anymore, right? You're, you, you're using your one disc of redundancy and then you'll put, so at this point, if another drive died, you would lose data. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So right now, if, if I look at, you know, it says, yeah, well, you have a Synology hybrid RAID with one drive protection. Right. Right. And and so you are you are rolling those dice much like I was with a dead battery in my UPS last week. But uh, and that's still how it is, by the way, folks, I I did order a new battery, though. So that's good. That's good. Yeah. I mean, I'm not really rolling the dice because I'm doing a full backup of that NAS to my other Synology, which you can do with their backup ah, software. Yeah, yeah, right. Right. You're using Synology's hyper backup for that, John? Yes. Cool. Yeah, so I back up the contents of one or the other, so that's my uh, second yeah. level of redundancy, if you will, so I'm, I'm not too worried. Smart man. Smart man. But I, that's good. But I do want to get that drive, and then, actually, I was surprised, so I, so I decided to get one of the uh, Iron Wolf, um, Seagate Iron Wolf drives. Yep which uh, have special features on the Synology and a four terabyte. It was only like 120 bucks or something. That's awesome. Wow, that's, that's great. <laughs> really? Wow. Yeah. And then they have two levels. So you can get just the iron wolf, which has extra features, or you can get iron wolf and then get data protection as well, or like data recovery service. Oh, that's right. Which was a tens of dollars more. But uh, I did you get, did that. you get that? No. Okay. All right. No, no, I think that's more for enterprise you know, where you need the, the drive, like, saved. Yeah, this isn't, <laughs> Critical you know, data. I'm looking on Amazon here. You're right. Even at the, like, it, it just came up with the 10 terabyte, you know, and then you can drive around and uh, on the site and find different sizes. But even the 10 terabytes, 314 bucks. And the 12 is 408. Like, that's really not bad. Wow. All right. I'll put a, uh, I'll put a link to the four terabyte, the one that you got. But, you know, everybody... Everybody knows you can you can just drive around and um, and find the uh, find them all. So wow, that's pretty good, man. Yeah. So the four terabyte, like you said, is one nineteen ninety five. With the data recovery, it is one seventy four ninety nine. So you know, yeah, you're adding. I mean, it's a you're you're buying a, essentially a warranty for their service, right? So, uh, yeah four terabytes yeah and uh another but i was gonna get and um actually this is being mentioned in our uh in our chat room here at MacGeekGab mac geek gab dot com slash stream but another good choice for nas is uh western digital has what they call a red drive which is uh i guess specifically designed for 24 <clears throat> 7 use inside of a nas um yep. yep so that's another good choice but I didn't get that one. Maybe I'll get that for my next one. Yeah, well, it's fun to play with those Iron Wolf drives. I've got a couple of those in my um, in my in one of my Synologies here. I mean, it's interesting. It's you know, for the home user, I, I maybe overkill, I, but I don't know, right? You, you know, um, well, those, it gives you additional data on a Synology, right? I mean, they have some API or something where you can get additional statistics or reporting. I, I don't know. Yeah, but it also like the Synology. It's really what Iron Wolf does with the Synology is it takes what we all would have expected smart to do for our hard drives and actually does it like that. The NAS and the drive are able to com communicate about the drive's health. Um, it even checks like, you know, rotational anomalies and things like that. I mean, it's crazy what it does, but, um, but you know, it works. And here's the interesting thing for at, at the four terabyte price, even at the 10 terabyte price, the Western digital red drives, at least from Amazon are more than the, uh, Seagate iron wolves. So <laughs> there you go. I don't know. Go figure, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Hey, uh, you know, we set up our, our new forums at MacGeekGab.com slash forums. And things are moving well. You folks are signing up and having some fun and playing and uh, actually getting some questions answered. So I wanted to go through some of those, if that's okay with you, my 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 esteemed colleague and friend here. Does that work? Oh, of course. Sweet. So let's start with one from Mark. Uh, on the subject of Synology, he said, I tried setting up my new Synology as a time machine backup. There are two one terabyte drives in two of the four bays, so plenty of room. Problem is the space that I have allotted fills up and when it is time for it to run a backup again time machine says that it cannot because the disk is full it's not taking off the oldest data to make room as happens in my airport attached time machine disk does anyone know how to fix this behavior so this is interesting um it it should right the, the destination of a time machine backup should not at least in my experience hasn't changed its behavior in terms of uh the where it rotates out the old to make room for the new but there are times when there is simply too much new data to rotate out old stuff I, i've seen that before um and and when that happens you either need to manually go in and clear things out which you can do you can go into the time machine interface and start deleting things from from the backups but um, that, yeah, so that, like that can happen, but and you or you might just need to start your time machine backup over. I, I find that I have to do that about once a year with my time machine backups. They just get to the point where they're tied in knots. And it's like, all right. Yeah, yeah. I just had to do that myself. Yeah. So so one thing to mention here is that there is in the time machine interface, if you click on options, there's a checkbox notify after old backups are deleted. Um, I think that's, sh I don't know if that's checked by default, but if it's not, you may want to check it. Just maybe that'll give it a nudge in the right direction. Or it could be that it's trashed. I, I just had this where my uh, MacBook Pro backup, which is like two years old, it was going back to like 2016, um, got stuck in the state where it says preparing backup and never finished preparing for the backup. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, bye. Yeah, bye. Make a new one. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it was just it was just in a state where it never it never got past that point. I even tried to restore from a backup uh, an earlier, you know, version of, of the, the time machine file and that that didn't fix it either. So I don't know. But yeah, no, I'm with you. It's a, it's a I think a good thing to uh, recreate that because it, it, it will eventually. Well, I don't know why it should. I mean, I'm, I'm actually surprised that it lasted two years. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. One one thing with Synology and Time Machine while we're here, and and Mark may have done this. Uh, he wasn't. He we didn't really talk about it yet. But is uh, setting up Time Machine quotas or setting up quotas for your Time Machine backups? Uh, time Machine, as as most of us know, and if you don't, well, that's why you're here. You there's one of the five things that you're going to learn. Uh will fill up all the available space that it sees. So Synology has a way of limiting the space that any given user sees with quotas. So even if you have like a, you know, in this case, he's got a one terabyte volume, right? It, you know, he could say, well, I only want Time Machine to have 300 gigs of space available to it. So... What I'm going to do is you set up a user that's only used for that time machine backup and that user only gets 300 gigs of data, even though it's on a one terabyte volume. It don't, that user can only see 300 gigs. Time machine will only see 300. And when it hits that 300 limit, it'll roll around. So it's possible that what's going on with Mark here is that he's actually hitting not just the storage limits of what his time machine user can see, but if the time machine user has no quota, he might be hitting the storage limits of the actual volume on the Synology, and that could be causing trouble too. So I've got uh, I've got links in the forum post there that uh, that that we've linked to from the from the show notes for for all of those. All right, we have uh, we have another forum post to go to, John. This one from listener David, and listener David writes, if I can, if the if the web will. Cooperate. He says, I've been using Intego Virus Barrier to protect my iMac for the last several years. 
It has served me well, but I think there are better options. I've been doing some research, and the two that have bubbled up to the top of my list are so Sophos Home Premium and Bitdefender Total Security 2018. I was wondering what other people are using and why they like it. And of course, this led to a, uh, a healthy discussion in the forums about how folks are using, but if folks are using virus protection and how. Uh, my advice, and and you know, most people don't buy an alarm for their house until after they've been broken into the first time, right? So let's bear that in mind and and accept that we're all humans here. Uh, that said, I've never gotten any viruses or malware on my Mac, but I do run malware bytes. Uh, I run the the free version. It does not run in real time. I don't think threat concerns are high enough to warrant running an engine in the background in real time all the time. So I don't feel the need to pay for an, an engine that I'm not going to use, but I do use malware bytes in the free mode. And once a week I scan my drives um, or with it. And I actually built a little keyboard maestro uh, trigger so that, you know, every week it, it comes in and I did screen scripting so that it knows where to go and click and start the thing. And even if the keyboard maestro macro fails, it's at least launched malware bytes and I see it. I'm like, oh, yeah, I got to run it. And so I run it once a week. It has yet to find anything. But uh, but that's what I do. So what do you do? Not much of anything. OK. Every once in a great while, if I think I've been bamboozled, like one time I was looking for a, a media player. And, sure. Uh, managed to find one that slipped past me and. uh I thought was legit, but was not and right. installed some malware. So fired up malware bytes, um, it found it, I got rid of it and everything's good. Um, every now and then I'll run clam clam AV mm. <clears throat> just to see what's on my system. And that'll find some interesting things, mostly in email, like weird scripting or redirections or stuff like that. But, um, I just do that more out of curiosity, but, um, th those are pretty much the, the, two that I run, but not really on a regular basis. And are you running Clam XAV? Is that? Well, yeah, that's the. Uh, okay. I just want to make sure we put the, the right Apple. one in the show notes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the, the Apple variation. Yeah. So, uh, Clam and AV is a uh, multi-platform. Right. Yes. Know. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And, and Chiron in the uh, chat room says he uses Mac scan once a week which is from securemac.com. So I'll put links for all three of those in the show notes. And that way, that way everything's covered. Good. Yeah. Cool. And what else? Uh, latest um, drive genius also has malware uh, detection, right? That's true. That's right. Oh yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah. 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 Good stuff. So I think I actually, I think at one point I actually had malware bytes installed, but then because it's kind of redundant, because I think they use the same engine, um, I, I deinstalled that. Hmm. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Like I said, I just run it in manual mode and, and there you go. So cool. Yeah, right, I think one, the biggest oh, threat most people have is not so much viruses and malware and stuff like that, but it's getting fished, getting fooled by, uh, of course, by someone to, uh, Give up your sensitive information or credit cards or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and I've got this last one from the forums in here as a quick tip, uh, but it wasn't intended that way. But in typical Mac Geek Gab fashion, sometimes we learn things sort of along the ride here in in the forums. Allison Sheridan uh, pod feet, as, as she is known in the forums, says on all of my devices, do not disturb isn't being respected I have a scheduled DND from 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. And yet in the middle of the night, 2.39 a.m. to be exact, my Mac lit up and bonged when the messages app received a message. Yesterday, I was trying to record that video of my iPhone. So I turned on DND and I kept getting telegram messages. This is really aggravating anyone else having this problem. And so there are some troubleshooting things that, that th folks have gone through with her there, including, you know, turn it off and turn it back on which uh, oftentimes will fix things like this. I, I'm not sure if it has for her, but the thing that I learned, the quick tip, I had no idea that Mac OS had a scheduled do not disturb setting. 
And, uh, and as I was reading her question, I thought, wait, we're, you can't do that. You can, it turns out, go to system preferences, notifications, do not disturb, which is at the very top of the list. And there it is to not do, turn on, do not disturb. And you can check a box that says, you know, from one time to another, or when the display is sleeping or when mirrored to TVs and projectors, the latter two are on by default. I, as I understand it, the first one is not, of course, you've got to turn that on. So pretty cool. I always love little quick tips. You know how that, you know how I am with that, John. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty good. Pretty good. All right. Uh, you know what? Let's, um, let's take a minute and talk about, uh, a, a few of our sponsors here. How's that sound, John? Fantastic. Awesome. Our first sponsor for this episode is a new sponsor for Mac Geek Gab. It is 1Password at the number one password, P-A-S-S-W-O-R-D.com. And if you visit 1Password.com slash Geek Gab, I know it's not our normal MGG thing, so you'll just have to remember. Or just go to the, the show notes and you can click it there. You get three months of 1Password 7 for free. So one password is a password manager, right? It allows you to store and save your passwords. It allows you to create unique passwords. It allows you to store secure notes. It allows you to store your credit cards. It allows you to store uh, your driver's license. I actually keep a picture of my passport in there too. Great, great stuff. And what one password adds that really makes it intriguing and perhaps worth uh, for those of you that maybe one password is the one that I use and always have. But uh, if you haven't tried it in a while, check this part out in one password seven. They have something called Watchtower that tells you if one of your passwords has been compromised. So if, if you have a password that some that that made it to one of those lists out there on the internet of passwords that people use that you should try if you want to hack accounts. Watchtower compares your passwords. It does all this local on your machine, compares your passwords to these lists and says, yep, your password's compromised. So there's no question whether or not your passwords are compromised. And then, of course, it obviously will will facilitate the process of changing that. And also if you're using the same password on more than one site, uh, or if you're, if you have weak passwords, it will warn you about that too. Like, Hey, you're using the same password in all these places. You, you know, that's not a good thing. So this is, this is the cool part. This is the exciting part about uh, one password, uh, at least, you know, for me, cause it's new and, and that part is cool. So check it out. Go to one password, the number one password.com slash geek gab. You get three months for free. Our thanks to the great folks at one password for sponsoring this episode. Our second sponsor, John is code weavers with crossover crossover is a way to run windows apps on your Mac without having to run windows, which is very cool means you don't have to buy a Windows license. You don't have to worry about Windows malware like we were just talking about there, right? You don't have to worry about Windows viruses. You don't have to manage Windows at all. You just use Crossover and boom, you're good to go. And if you haven't tried this one in a while, it's worth testing again because very recently they've made some significant changes to both the polish and the stability. And, you know... Feeling nostalgic this summer? You, did you know that you can play a lot of your old Windows games on your Mac with Crossover? In fact, that's one of the things people do with it so much is they wind up playing so many of these Windows games out there with Crossover. Of course, you can also use things like Quicken and Microsoft Office, and there's lots and lots of apps supported with this. It's a really great concept, and it works really well. So check it out. Go to codeweavers.com slash MGG. The first thing you get is a 14-day free trial, which I highly recommend you use. That way you can make sure that the apps that you want to use work with this pair, this non-Windows paradigm, right? And then also at codeweavers.com slash MGG, 35% off a one-year subscription. Use code MGG for that. So check it out. Codeweavers.com slash MGG and our thanks 
to the folks at Crossover, or the folks at Code Weavers with Crossover for sponsoring this episode. Our third sponsor today is Other World Computing at MaxSales.com. Man, you know, these are the folks that we look at when we need to get RAM for our Macs, for our Macs that support adding RAM. They're the ones that we look at when we need an external hard drive. You know, because they, they build these enclosures. If you need to replace your SSD in your Mac, they know what to do there too. Speaking of Windows, did you know that the Thunderbolt 3 docks that Otherworld Computing sells are compatible with both Macs and Windows PCs? That's pretty cool. And, you know, if you're not running a Thunderbolt 3 dock, actually go listen to Friday's Daily Observations podcast for all about why you want to run uh, Thunderbolt on your Mac. It is the expansion bay of today, right? It's the way to do it. And OWC's Thunderbolt 3 dock is awesome. And they are now offering battery upgrades for all MacBook Pro Retina display models. That means if you've got battery problems with your MacBook Pro, go to Otherworld Computing at MacSales.com. They have the answers for you now, including all the MacBook Pros with Retina displays. So check it out. Otherworld Computing at MacSales.com. And our thanks to them for being a sponsor of this episode as well. All right, John, you want to take us to Rob? I'm going to take us to Rob. And Rob writes in and says... I have an odd problem since I upgraded my work iMac to Mac OS 10.13 High Sierra. The iMac is a late 2013 3.2 gigahertz quad core i5 with 32 gigabytes of RAM and the one terabyte fusion drive. It has a 1920 by 1080 pixel Dell monitor attached. I use an Apple extended keyboard and a magic trackpad. The issue, when I activate the screensaver using the hot corner I have set up top left, the iMac does not respond to the keyboard or trackpad while the screensaver is active. Once the monitor goes to sleep, it responds at expected to keyboard when I want to wake it up. Likewise, if the screensaver activates automatically, I have it set to kick in after 10 minutes, the computer refuses to respond to keyboard and trackpad until the monitor goes to sleep. However, if I bypass the screensaver using the new in 10.13 lock screen command with keyboard shortcut control command Q, it responds to the keyboard as expected when I want to unlock. This behavior under screensaver seems to be specific to this machine. A colleague's machine also on 10.13 has expected behavior. Thoughts? Um, yeah, I got some thoughts. Cool. I haven't seen this. Well, I don't really use screensaver that much, but um, I just put the screen to sleep. But anyways, so maybe you don't want to use a screensaver. I don't know. Um, but the only thing I can think of that I have seen in the past is that you could have a corrupt screensaver module. Right? Yeah, um, right. Oh, right. Because that is a little piece of software, if you will, right? That your Mac is invoking when it hits this condition of, of deciding to run the screensaver, either time-based or, you know, mouse movement-based or whatever. Yeah. And it's a little, you know, it's a little program and it displays pretty graphics. So it has to be doing some computation. Yeah. Um, and, and you can actually see some of the pieces here, but then this is what makes me, uh, and this started me going down a rabbit hole here. So you can, you can find some of the pieces, you know, if you look for screensavers on your system, there's a slash system slash library slash screensavers. It's also in slash library, also in slash library and also in home folder slash library you'll see components of it. Then here's the other thing, which leads me to a suggestion is that I also found, so if I typed in the name of uh, some of the screensavers that you see in the system preference, some of the pieces were buried deep within the operating system, like within this private framework. So what I think, well, one thing you could do is choose a different screensaver. Maybe mm. that, that just the one you have nope. selected is corrupt. Yeah, that would at least be a good test. That's right. Yeah, yeah. The other thing is that uh, one of the damaged pieces could be in the operating system, as I found. So, uh, you know, go into a, either get your, um, I think the best way would be uh, to reinstall the OS, probably doing it through recovery. So you get the uh, the latest version, right? Yeah. And um, hopefully that'll over, overwrite the faulty screensaver file or system component. And that's what I got to say about that. 
Huh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like it. Yeah, yeah. That, I, I don't have anything more to add to that. That's that. That's where I would go with it. Yeah, right. Because it, it, well, and at the very least, like you said, switching from one to another would be the, a good test, right? So at least you know, okay, yeah, it's definitely that screensaver, not screensavers in general. So, yeah. Yeah, cool. I was just looking, uh, you know, I, so... I upgraded my Mac in the studio here to High Sierra earlier this week, John. Finally, uh, High Sierra is the last OS that will run on this machine. But I'm always, you know, three, six plus months behind on major version upgrades here in the studio because I need to make sure the drivers are going to exist for any of the audio hardware we use. And also... I just want the machine to be reliable because we need to rely on it to do this real time, you know, operation of producing a podcast every week, actually several times a week with, you know, small business show and gig gab that I also do. So, uh, but I finally decided, you know, I was talking with someone as often happens. I give myself advice, uh, when talking with other people and, and somebody was saying, Oh, do you think it's okay to upgrade to high Sierra? And I say, Oh yeah, I see no reason why you would, you know, hold back at this point. It's, you know, it's mature enough. You're on Sierra already. It's like, the, I think you, I think you're okay. Of course I walked away from that conversation thinking, uh, I should take my own advice. So I did, but what I did, John, and this will get back to screensavers, but I'll talk through the process here briefly. I, cl- I clone with carbon copy cloner, uh, every day. And uh, that is automatically scheduled, right, to happen. I think on this machine, it happens at like 2.30 a.m. or something because uh, the studio is generally empty then. Maybe it's 4 a.m. I don't know. Uh, and so I did one last clone manually. And then I turned, I changed the schedule. And it's not set to clone again until tomorrow morning. And the reason is... I wanted to make sure I could get through a Mac Geek Gab recording without any trouble before I blew away my clone of Sierra. Because right now, if worse comes to, you know, if we started to record the show today and it was like, whoa, okay, big problems. I could just easily reboot to the, the external drive that has the clone on it and boom. We're recording from Sierra. I could, you know, I could move it back and, and we're in good shape. Uh, I don't think that's going to need to happen given where we are in this episode. And if you folks are hearing this episode, then that means success. But, you know, that's what I did. And uh, and actually, I did the whole thing using uh, screens from Adovia. Uh, I, I didn't want to have to sit here in the studio to babysit an iMac that was going through a operating system upgrade. So I did it from my iPad from the house using screens, which is, um, a, you know, a remote desktop type client that that's actually really really good so i'll put a i'll put a link to that in the show notes too but um but yeah yeah that's uh that's what i did there john and so far so good i hope but where it comes back uh, do you have any questions or comments about my upgrade process no no good strategy uh yeah, don't wipe out the old one quite yet. Right, but I also <laughs> didn't want to forget, because I've done it in the past where I've just disabled the clone and then realized three months later, holy crap, I haven't been cloning that machine, right? Because I turned it off and thought I would just remember to turn it back on when I felt it was safe. With this, I gave myself a deadline. Now, obviously, if even if things were a little flaky today or, or turn out to be a little flaky, I could kick that can down the road and schedule it instead of starting tomorrow morning. I could schedule it for, say, Thursday morning, right, or, or whatever. But by setting the future date as the first date of the, of the schedule anew, that way, I, you know, if things were working fine and I don't think about it, uh, and I almost didn't think about it here until, in fact, until you mentioned screensaver, I didn't even think about, oh yeah, we're on high Sierra. Um, but it, you know, having that schedule set, it was, it was good to go. But the reason, and maybe we have a problem because John tells me he can't hear me anymore, but this happened before and it was his issue. So hang on, let me see if I can bring John back. All right, John's back. Uh, so yeah, this is the second time this has happened with discord today. Uh, as Michael King in the, in the chat room said, maybe you do want to kick the can down the road with the, uh, with the clone. I don't, 
I, I, in, in this case, at least all of my troubleshooting and my gut says that this is an issue happening on your end, John, not, not here only because I don't have to make any changes. Uh, all you do is quit and relaunch discord, which is the app we use to, to communicate over the internet. And, uh, and then you get my audio back and, and I haven't done anything here. Like, you know, hands off throttle and stick kind of thing. Uh, so I think it's something with, with your end and discord is, is finicky with changes to audio devices. So I'm, I'm wondering two things I I don't, obviously I don't think you're ch making changes to your audio device intentionally while we're recording. R right. <laughs> I mean, my only audio device is my uh, my Yamaha uh, right. mixer over USB. That's that's it. And so, is your machine doing? So, USB is is very sensitive to system interrupts. Is your machine doing something like a backup or anything like that, where there's high disk usage or you know some background process that that might be impacting? uh your you know the the connection to your usb device because if it if it drops off and comes back a split second later discord might be hypersensitive to that whereas other apps might not be i mean piezo is running alongside it but um but you don't have like time machine trying to back no, up no, in the background no, or I, anything i run all that stuff at like three in the morning yeah 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 okay yeah no, and, and when was the last time you rebooted that mac uh, gee, how could you tell? Well, I'll tell you one way to tell. Go into the terminal and type uptime, and it says four days. Well, that's so okay. I rebooted four days ago. Yeah. All right. Huh. I don't know. There is a new, this is a new version of Discord there, that, you know, that came out on the 21st. So certainly new for us here for Mac Keycap. So maybe that's part of it. All right. Um, but where I was going with all of this is the uh, High Sierra screensavers. On my iMac in the office, I am able to see the uh, basically the same screensavers that I have on my Apple TV, like all of the cool drone flyovers of cities or or whatever. And I can't find those here. To, and I can't remember if I added those manually or if... Uh, I thought they were just there in High Sierra, but I don't see them as an option here. Do you remember how that works, John? I don't know. Mm. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. So you haven't, you haven't. I, I got to look now. That, so that that's uh, it. Could be a geek challenge. I'm I'm sure I can go get the answer by looking down on my iMac, but I'm not going to do that right now because I'm here with all of you. So. Uh, but, but it is, I love having those screensavers on my iMac, you know, I'll come back into the office or whatever. And it's like, you know, you get those beautiful drone flyovers, especially on like a retina 20 inch, inch screen or whatever. Michael King in the chat room is saying, I have to go out and get them, which must be what I did. So cool. All right. Uh, we will, we will get a link for where to go and do that. Cause it is sort of a beautiful thing to get. So, all right. Uh, let's talk to Rick. Rick um, Rick writes, I have a Drobo DDR3 that has been giving me trouble for a while. I use it for a non-bootable carbon copy cloner backup of my MacBook Pro's SSD and as a time machine backup. Every few weeks, I cannot mount the main Drobo drive. I never have, never seem to have a problem with the time machine partition. Most of the time when this happens, either disk utility or disk warrior will fix it. But sometimes nothing works. I have erased and reformatted the Drobo a few times, but the problem keeps reoccurring. I normally have the Drobo plugged into an OWC Thunderbolt dock, which I then plug into my MacBook Pro. However, I, I think I have also had the same issue when plugging in directly, so I don't think it's the dock. Any ideas uh, as to how to tell what's happening? I don't know if something is wrong with the Drobo, my Mac, or possibly it is at time for a clean install of High Sierra. I can't remember how many versions of Mac OS it's been since I did a clean install. Any suggestions would be appreciated before I give up. So, you know, generally, and I, I will emphasize the word generally, any issues with direct attached, you know, RAID type drives like a Drobo, uh, are treated just like you would any other direct attached disc. 
And, and of course that's exactly what, what Rick's been doing here, right? He's, um, you know, he's, he's using disk utilities, using disk warrior, like the things that would use, you would use for an internal drive or an external drive, right? These, all of these raid type things, generally speaking, just appear as disks uh, or perhaps multiple partitions or multiple volumes on a single disk to Mac OS. But obviously something's still amiss. The fact that this is happening routinely is, you know, sort of the head scratcher. Um, so the way I'm looking at it is there's either some part of your daily workflow that kills the file system structure of that particular volume, or there's something wrong with the way that volume is formatted itself. So you could try reformatting the volume. I, volume. I know you've said that you've erased it. I'm not sure if that just means you're kind of erasing it in place or if you're actually doing a remove the partition and re-add the partition. You can do some level of that with disk utility and then you can do more of that with Drobo dashboard. My advice at this point would be to do Drobo dashboard. In fact, the only reason to use disk utility would be to see if you if you really care about knowing exactly where the problem lies, right? But um, because if it doesn't work with, with disk utility, then you're going to use Drobo dashboard anyway. So I would just jump to that. You're going to have to, you know, either way, you're wiping out the contents of that. So you either need to back it up or, you know, or lose it. But um, but that's that's what I would do here is is use Drobo dashboard to remove and recreate that volume. And and then let's see what's happening. Right. You know, and, and I guess the, the other thing to ask, although I think you would have included this in, in your question, but. I never like to assume if you're getting those messages from the system that says, Hey, this drive disconnected improperly. You should be careful about that. Um, it doesn't quite say it that way, but, but that's the, that's the message you get. If you're getting those, then, you know, check the cable or whatever, but you know, the fact that time machine, your time machine partition is doing just fine. It indicates to me that that part of things is probably okay. So that's that's where I've got on this, John. What about you? Uh, the one thing I check out. So you mentioned the uh, Drobo dashboard. <clears throat> Excuse me. And there is a tool section, and um, there's a software update section. Um, manually check for an update. Uh, every once in a great while, they'll have a firmware update. There may be a firmware update, and I found that. Drobo, like many other programs, isn't necessarily very proactive in looking for updates. It takes something. Manual intervention may be required. So give that a whirl, too. Yeah. 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 Not bad. Now, I see they have. Oh, I haven't. I don't know if I've ever done this. I mean, there's a scary looking button here. I'm actually floating over. It says Drobo reset. Which I'm going to assume is like. Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't want to press it because I hover over it and it's red. Yeah, that might that might be bad. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm thinking that would reformat the whole thing. I don't know. Right. I have to read up on that. Right. Right. Yeah, I, I, I think at some level it would. I, I, I don't want to say for sure that it wouldn't happen with the first click. I think you get a warning uh, where you have to type in the word erase or something. Where Okay. Know. No, here we go. Yeah, that's exactly what it does. So. Okay. um. Well, I'm looking at the help and it says, click this option to reset the drives in the selected Drobo device to factory standards. This erases all data on the drives. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So there you go. Cool. 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 Yeah. So I like, it's hard to say, um, but it sure seems like I, I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. My, yeah, I, I don't know. My gut, my gut doesn't have a, a, a leaning on this one, whether it's, you know, user slash workflow error or, you know, functional error between the, the system and the Drobo or with the Drobo itself. It's hard to say. But while we're on the subject of drives and external media and all of that stuff, I think it's time for uh, for us to to spend a little time with APFS. Does that uh, does that work for you, John? <laughs> sure. OK. Cool. And and we might as well make use of, of the audio file that we have. So, uh, so, you know, here we go. Oh, of course I've got all the sound muted. I do this every week, don't I? Because I, I, you know, I, I move the slider down, the fader down 
for the the recorded audio so that at the end of the episode I can fade in the band, right? But uh, but of course that doesn't work when you want to do something like this. It's time for a deep deep, deep, deep dive. I'll get better with it, folks. Trust me on that. Uh, we will start with Michael. And with Michael here, he asks, I've decided to finally upgrade my Max to High Sierra. Hey, welcome to the club. Since I want to be ready to go to Mojave when it's released, I'm wondering what to do with my many, many external drives. Once I've upgraded, do you recommend upgrading those to APFS as well? Or is it wiser to keep those with HFS plus? So here's the thing. Now, for your external drives, for your internal drive, if the system offers to upgrade it or just does upgrade it like that, that generally, OK, I, you still want clones of, of anything, especially your boot drives, but, you know, back and backups of everything. But um, for your external drives, I wouldn't go out of your way to change their formats to APFS just yet, at least not as a general rule. That said, if you have a drive, an external drive where you use multiple partitions then it might be worth considering APFS because APFS doesn't force you to waste storage when you're partitioning a drive in the, in the old paradigm, the HFS plus paradigm, but really the paradigm that we've lived with, with any file system we've really used widespread anyway on the Mac. If you had a one terabyte drive and you decided, okay, I want to dedicate 500 gigs to my time machine or let's say 500 gigs to my clone and 500 gigs to general storage. That would be it. Your general storage, even if you didn't put anything out there, your general storage would be using 500 gigs of space, meaning that there was only 500 gigs of space available uh, for your clone. However, with APFS, that's not quite how it works. With APFS, an entire blob of storage. And, and, and I should say, that with partitions, the space on the drive is actually allocated to each of those partitions. It is not only a logical distinction, but it is a physical distinction too, right? So this space is dedicated to that partition. The, the other space is dedicated to the second partition. With APFS, that's not how it works. APFS says, okay, give me a blob of storage. Great. Okay, here's the whole drive. Great. That's the blob. Now, how would you like me to address this, right? And, and you can say, okay, cool. Well, I want two partitions and I want one of them, uh, you know, I want my time machine or my clone to max out at, uh, at you know, 500 gigs or whatever, like to top it off at that. And then I want this other one and you can top it off here or maybe not top it off. And now APFS will allow you to see all of that storage kind of all at once with limits similar to what you would do in Drobo dashboard for the Drobo, right? That's how that's been for a while. And now you can do that with APFS. So if you've got something where you've got partitions, it can be interesting, especially if you've got, you know, one for say your clone and then one just for your general backups or general usage you, you know, the, the, you're not limited by the choices you make out of the gate, you could down the road say, you know, my clone's really only using 400 gigs. So why don't I cap that off there and uh, and make a little more space available for my other data? And that you can just do that on the fly, non-destructively. It's really no fanfare because all you're doing is changing a logical separator to say, OK, yeah, that that's how much storage that you know, partition or volume uses. It's not really a partition anymore. That's how much that volume uses and everything else. So that's why you might want to consider this for an external drive, but do so carefully because APFS is young and we don't have enough experience with it. So expect that you may need to rely on your backups of whatever you've put on that volume at some point. And so just bear that in mind. That's my feeling on it, John. Uh, what, what do you think? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Pretty much. <clears throat> yeah. And then, yeah, I'd probably, but unless you want to explore, like you, you were suggesting the uh, features of APFS. Right. Right. I mean, me, I decided to reformat my external um, 
backup drives for my carbon copy cloner as a PFS, just, just because I wanted to experience the pain. <laughs> Uh, and they were working fine for a while. I was getting, you know, those false positives for a while about right. there being problems, but uh, that went away. So I, I think they've uh, they made some sort of update. Good, good. Yeah, I, you know, and and you don't have to reformat as APFS. You can use Disk Utility to convert HFS Plus to APFS. But if you want to do these partition volume things. You're better. I think you're better off starting from scratch because converted volumes, especially multi volume converted drives, aren't quite laid out the way they would be if you started them from scratch, at least based on what I've seen. That may have changed, right? The the converter. Does it still allow you? I thought it wouldn't allow, normally allow you to convert a rotational drive. To APFS, but it would let you do that with an SSD. Is that still true? Um, I maybe it was just in the early days. I, I, I don't thought think they, uh... so. Yeah, let me let me look here. No, I I have an external rotational drive on this machine. I just updated this machine, as I said, from Sierra to High Sierra, mm -hmm. and in Disk Utility in the Edit menu. I can choose convert to APFS, but again, this is a drive with, well, it's a drive with two partitions. So I would be converting each partition separately to APFS. That's not really what I'd want to do. So best scenario would be to offload all this stuff and then format the drive from scratch so that it sees the entire blob of data as APFS. So, yeah, cool. All right. Uh, going on to listener, Matt, who says, uh, who says I installed a fresh copy of Mac OS 10.13.4 uh, on a two terabyte SSD with file vault encryption and APFS case sensitive file system. I then tried to install Adobe creative cloud and it will not let me do so because my file system is case sensitive. Is there any other way than a full reinstall of OS 10 to change this? And this is one of those scenarios where the answer is no. Once you have set your volume to be either case sensitive or not case sensitive, the default being not. Uh, once you've set your volume that way, the way, the only way to change it that I've found is to reformat the volume. You don't need to repartition or relay out things, but you do need to reformat the volume and choose not case sensitive. So, so. There you go. And that that's true with both APFS and HFS plus. I, I would stay away from a case sensitive file system unless you have a very specific need for it. Um, it, 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 there are problems like this, a creative cloud, sort of a common one, but, but it's not the only one where the way the software is written is assuming or expecting a non case sensitive file system. So, what do you think, John? I'm with you. I've I've never found a compelling reason to uh, do case sensitive, and as we've observed, uh, some software for a stupid reason uh, won't work with case sensitive. I don't know why that is. I don't either. Yeah, right. But yeah, obviously, some decision was made. You know, deep in the code base at some point, where somebody said, "Well, just assume it's it's you know case insensitive," which of course it's just. They're always a bad idea, you know, assume something that we can't control. Yeah. But it will warn you like creative cloud will say, no, I won't install. I expect case sensitive, non case sensitivity and you have it. So at least the, at least you don't have to encounter the, the wonky, you know, data loss problems or whatever might happen. It just says, no, no, we're not going to run. So cool. All right. You want to take us to Brent, John? Oh, boy. Yeah, this is a good one. So, Brent has a 2013 iMac with a 3 terabyte Fusion drive. During a recent Carbon Copy Cloner backup, I received the following errors. And the error was along the lines of the file or folder is sitting on a bad sector of your hard disk hmm. and is unrecoverable. That's the gist of the error. And there were like five files that I identified. So, based on that, should I be concerned that the rotational hard drive in my iMac is failing? There doesn't seem to be any issues when using the system, and I'm still able to access the 
picture files above. Okay, some of the error files. All right, so that's kind of weird. <clears throat> the carbon copy cloner reported an error, but when he read the file again, it was fine. Or appeared to be fine. Um, second question, can I safely delete the dot dist file? Yeah, well, one of the files that had an error was in slash private slash var slash blah, blah, blah. Dot dist. As far as I can tell, the dot dist file is something from, um, uh, I think it's like a receipt or an installer script or something. Okay. Um, so I do not, I actually tried to get to that part of the system and it wouldn't let me in. I mm. tried to dig into my private var. It, it, it's a big, long path. Sure. And uh, it's a, no, it's like, I won't let you in that directory, even if I did a sudo. So, um, right. Wow. Well. So I don't know if there's a way to get get that stuff back maybe disable system integrity protection to get there yeah but i, I don't think they're critical again i think it's like a, it's like an installer script so okay. you know if it's not there um you know you go to the app store and re-download the app and then you're then you're good right right and he says well i did get a warning from drive genius five um I did a repair check and it did not turn up anything wrong. All right. So this is interesting. So my thoughts as follows. Um, so I'm also a CCC user. I've, I've never seen that specific errors. Um, I did have, as, as we mentioned in the past, I'll, I'll, I'll move along here, but um, it could have been, I actually did have um one of my programs indicate there was a problem and it thought the disk was bad. It was actually a flaky cable or connector. So could be that even though it's in your, an internal drive, you know, it could be a connection issue. Sure. Maybe. I mean, it's an older machine. These things have been known to happen. Uh, yeah. The disk file, I'll just skip over that, but I think you may want to run. I mean, it sounds like it's failing kind of like I had my, my situation there. You may want to run a different utility to do a bit more analysis rather than I can't read this because it could have been a one off event that, you know, this just happened and it's not going to happen again uh, or it may keep happening. Um, and I suggested maybe something like Drive DX. Drive DX is not, well, Smart Reporter is one, Drive DX is another. Smart Reporter is kind of basic. Drive DX does a, what I'll call a bit more predictive or intelligent uh, analysis and that if it sees certain parameters, uh, getting to a certain point, it'll say, yeah, you know, I think something's wrong here. Um, and then, yeah, he, he actually ran it. So, so we actually got drive DX okay. and, uh, what did it say? Ah, yes, here we go. So here's the, uh, here's the error that it reported, uh, on his drive that they thought was not really good. And it's something co called reported uncorrectable errors. And that basically means that there's there's some pro low level problems on your drive. Is that it tried to read it? So this is this is confirming what he saw in CCC, but it's giving a bit more detail. And if you hover over this uh, drive DX, you know they're, they're like wizards that with all these values mean, and that value means uh, your drive's starting to fail. So I'm not sure which one it is, but I would uh, I would get it serviced. It could be. It, I, I mean, it's probably. As we mentioned, it's probably the rotational portion. Right? Yeah, I would think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, drive DX. I, yeah. That's a, a, I always forget about that tool, but um, that's good. That's good. When I'm suspicious of a drive, it, it uh, yeah, it helps you dig deeper. So, so he said he's going to make an appointment with the Genius Bar. And I, I think bringing this additional information along with the uh, CCC error and the drive genius error will help them probably conclude that the drives on its way out. Yep. Which is kind of sad because I, what's a, what did you say? It was a 2013 machine. Well, okay. Five years old. Yeah. 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 I, I would expect a rotational drive to last more than five years. No, well, maybe not. How old's the drive that's dying for you right now in that Synology? Uh, I bought it about two years ago. Okay. Well, there you go. But then it was a certified refurb, so uh, so it may okay. have had some, may have already had had some mileage on it. Right, 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 right. All right, let's um, one last one in our little deep dive here, our mini deep dive, if you will, for APFS uh, from Robin, who says now that APFS is maturing and soon supporting fusion and rotational drives as well in macOS Mojave, I've noticed. 
that you are both starting to recommend it as a first class citizen. He says, I have one consideration to still choose for HFS plus, And it goes like this. Recently, I've been contacted to review disk recovery software for the Mac. I did ask the developers if APFS was already supported, which they confirmed, but with a side note stating it doesn't work as well as with HFS plus. You feel it coming, I guess, when you're getting in problems with a disk and you don't have proper backups or redundancy. It seems that formatting HFS plus is still to be preferred for its recoverability. And it, that's not surprising, right? With all of the history, well, two things, right? With all the history that we have with HFS plus, we have, we know more about it, right? We, we know how to dig into it better. We know how to fix those things or find those things. With HFS, with, sorry, with APFS, we don't have that history. It may not ever be possible to do data recovery from an APFS volume or may not ever be possible to do it as well as we currently can with HFS plus. Or, you know, as we learn more, it may turn out to be even more recoverable. But at the moment, yeah, yeah. All those utilities that we use for those disaster scenarios have far more history with HFS plus than they do APFS. So if it's something where you feel like you might need that, uh, then most certainly, you know, forego any of the new features or benefits of a of APFS and stick with HFS plus. But even in that scenario, whether you're running APFS or HFS plus, I would still say have backups, but if it's, truly mission critical data and you feel like you might get in a scenario where you need to use data recovery even that's not guaranteed with hfs plus it's just they know more about hfs plus so there you go thanks robin it's that's a that's a worthy point to consider and it and it and a nice way to kind of wrap this up with a with a temper a tempering of of our excitement for apfs just a reminder so good stuff good stuff yeah Anything on that, John, before we move out of this deep dive and, and perhaps go to some other questions? Nope. Okay. I want to take a minute and thank our premium subscribers, premium contributors for this week. I want to thank all of our premium subscribers. MacGeekUp.com slash premium is where you can go to learn all about that. And premium subscribers get a couple of benefits. One, of course, and the whole reason we created the program was because you asked for this one. That warm, fuzzy feeling you get when supporting your two favorite geeks. And John and I really, really appreciate that. Uh, in addition to that, you get access to the premium Mac, uh, premium at MacGeekGab.com email address. And now in the forums, you get a little badge that says you're a premium subscriber uh, right there on the forum. So folks know that you're, uh, you're you know, helping us keep the lights on and all that stuff. So. Uh, this week, coming in uh, on the monthly $10 plan, we have Gary B., Joseph W., Jeff F., Ev the Nerd, and Joseph B. P. And on the biannual $25 plan, we have Joe M., Richard N., Antonio B., and Dave G. Thanks to all of you. You really rock. It, uh, you know, I say it every week, and I know I say I say it every week, but um, it's true. And I'm happy to keep saying it every week. So thank you so much to all of you. If you want to learn more about it, again, MacGeekGab.com slash premium. Uh, another perk, uh, your, your premium account is the same account that you would use for the forum. So if you're already a premium subscriber, or even if you're not currently active, but have been a premium subscriber in the past, you've already got an account for the forums. So just go and log into that account and you're good to go. You don't need to create a new account. You're just, it's, 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 you know, we have one account for everything that happens under the Mac observer umbrella and the Mac geek Gab forums are part of the Mac observer site. So you're just good to go. You've got everything right there. So go check it out. Speaking of email, we had a little email issue this week, John. I got to your house on Friday morning. We had a little bit of time. We were going to uh, prep the show together. So you, we started digging into the email boxes and, and just verbally communicating about, okay, I'm going to get this one. I'll get this one. And you said, yeah, all right. I replied to, to oh, I forget who it was, maybe Joe or Jim or something. And I'm like, uh, I'm not seeing it, you know, because we, we make sure we, we copy back our, our email addresses so that we see 
uh, each other's answers and we have the history. I'm not seeing it, not seeing it. And then I realized I don't have any email in those boxes since Monday and it's Friday. This is bad. And I knew immediately what the problem was. I knew I, I have, uh, I have one, I have a couple of Gmail accounts that I use one sort of for my main email, all the stuff that comes directly to me. And then I have another Gmail account that I funnel everything else into, which includes all our Mac Geekab stuff, as well as all of the press releases that come into Mac Observer. And every few years, I need to go in and archive off all those old press releases from years past so that it doesn't fill up my 15 gig uh, space limit on Gmail. Well, that's what happened on Monday. I got no notification that this happened. Didn't seem like anybody was getting bounce messages that this happened. And yet, of course, it happened. Awesome. And of course, I realized this when I wasn't at home. So uh, I sent John down the task of, of continuing to answer your questions while I dug into this problem. And, uh, and so what I had to do was I VPN in from my laptop to the house. Uh, John, I don't know if you realized I did this and then remote accessed my using. Um, I just used the, you know, uh, uh, screen sharing because once you're VPN in, you can do that. Uh, I screen shared to my iMac here in the office because that's the machine that I archive all the local stuff to and uh, and started doing that archiving and moving things off and, and freeing up space on on Gmail. In fact, there's a weird way once you kind of move things off of gmail they don't leave you have to delete them and i've actually got a a, a a series of of search commands really one in particular i'll put it in the show notes uh the the code for it that that goes and finds old messages that aren't in my inbox they aren't in my sent box and aren't in my archive and then i can put those in the trash and delete it and i freed up the space and then what you what I haven't told you yet, John, is that over you know the next day or so, all of those messages came into my inbox. So I think it was within that five day delivery period that mail seems to um, seems to have on the internet. Like yeah, okay, it failed, but I'll I'll keep trying, you know, and uh, and so they all came in, and so we were able to get to your email, and obviously we we answered all your questions this week and all that stuff. But it was a, an interesting little tour this week, John. Yeah. Would have been nice if you got an alert. I really don't think I did. Um, I mean, it's possible that I did and missed it, but I, like, I, I'm pretty attentive to my email, I, <laughs> you know? So I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But it was not, uh, it was not a fun, uh, it was not a fun little excursion. So anyway. No, it's panic inducing. That it really was. You're yeah. not getting email. Yes, exactly. Yeah. It was like, oh man, this is bad. This is bad. But thankfully we caught it or, you know, it, uh, within whatever that period of time was so that the mail just got delivered once I freed up space. And so now I'm down to about eight gigs used and I'll be good for. So two things. I, I, I dealt with it and then I put a note on my calendar that I will, that, that recurs annually to remind me next June to go and do this again. And that way I'll never hit the, well, I say I'll never hit the limit, but you know, I'll have to knock on the, there's no wood nearby here. This is not good, John. I got to lean over and knock on some wood. All right, now we're good. Okay, cool. Uh, let's go to Phil, shall we? Sure. Phil, Oh, Phil, 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 where are you, Phil? Phil, actually, I think there might be two questions from the same Phil. Phil says, my wife and I are heading to Paris in the fall. He says, I know you've covered some topics about traveling abroad, but I have a question or two. He says uh, he wants to know uh, what to use for charging all of his devices. And um, he says, we both have T-Mobile and have free data and texting, just no call ability. But if we are on Wi-Fi, would a FaceTime audio call get around that? My thought is that since we have free data and use my phone as a Wi-Fi hotspot, I can have my wife connect and then her iPhone SE would also be on Wi-Fi. This is our, and a third question, the Airbnb has Wi-Fi. He says, but I have TunnelBear on my iPhone. Would you recommend using it on both of our phones? So 
three questions. The first um, about charging, he found, so you can find power converters that do two functions. Number one, they fit the outlets in where he's going in Europe, right? Um, but you know, you can find them that will fit the outlets wherever you go and then convert the power that they have over there from 220 down to 110 or 240 down to down to 120, but whichever way you want to cut it. What, which, which is more accurate, John? What do we have here? 110 or 120? It floats uh, between them, doesn't it? I believe 120 is the official figure. 120 okay. volts, 60 hertz. Yeah. All right. There you go. Um, but the reality is you might not need that second part. Because if you look, especially for all of your Apple devices, including just the little, you know, wall plug chargers for your, you know, your iPhone, they will all take variable voltage. It, you, you should absolutely check everything that you're going to plug in. But, um, but my guess is that you will find other than hair dryers, which you just don't bring with you either. Don't use one or, or, you know, use one that you get over there. Um, but you know, other than that and, and like curling irons and things like that, you know, that, that use heating coils, uh, everything else, especially that you're going to use for your electronics, most likely has a variable voltage, a power supply that will just take any voltage you throw at it. With that, you simply need a way to plug it into their plugs, which are different than what we have here. So uh, what I found when we traveled to Europe a couple of years ago, and I think is still the best deal going is that Rick Steves, which is, who is a travel blogger, etc., also sells all kinds of great things for traveling. And one of those things is a, um, is a, uh, you know, European power adapters. They also sell UK ones cause it's different. Um, but, they sell them for a dollar a piece. And really, that's all you need. So I, I bought, uh, I think I bought four of them for general Europe and then four for the UK because we were in both places. And, you know, I think it cost me less than 15 bucks, including shipping and all of that from Rick Steves. And that way, each member of the family had one wherever we were. And that would, turned out to be far more than enough because my wife and I really didn't need to, we, you know, we shared a bedroom. And so, we, you know, I used to single charger that we could all plug into and plug all our devices into. And it was totally fine. Um, so that's, um, that, that, that's the way I would go with that part of it. Um, any thoughts on that, John, before we move on to the, the other stuff? No, I just, I just looked at even this knockoff adapter. I have a non, non Apple one, even yeah. it has. And it says, yeah, I can take between 100 and 240, uh, Volts and uh, 50 to 60 hertz. Right. So it's just uh, happy with whatever. Yeah, exactly. But check. Yeah, I think that's pretty common with, yeah. with, at least with Apple stuff. It's like, why not just make it handle all the different types of electricity and then you just need the adapter. Yep. Right? Yep. Exactly. Exactly. And these adapters from Rick Steves are inexpensive. I loaned them to a friend who went to Ireland last year. And, you know, he's like, oh, yeah, it worked just fine because it because all it's doing is changing the shape and the, or the size or the orientation of the uh, the outlet. So it's really just, you know, just I mean, you could do it on your own if you if you wanted to, you know, get some prongs and stick it in the outlet and and connect the wires up. But that I am not recommending that you understand because you risk, you know, electrocuting yourself and and it's. It hurts more over there than it does here in the U.S. So, uh, so that's step one. Um, as far as FaceTime audio, if you have free data, you don't need to be on Wi-Fi to use FaceTime audio. You could use FaceTime audio across your data connection, uh, and that should work fine. I've done that many times, uh, and and it should work. Just be very cautious when doing that that you are not making a regular audio call that you are actually making a facetime audio call because otherwise you'll wind up using your travel abroad minutes and those as you stated are not included in your t-mobile plan so there you go that's um that that's that's my thoughts on that and i think that's a great idea for for communicating with people do, do, any thoughts on that before we move on to the vpn portion of this john yeah, any VoIP 
case thing. Yeah. Type thing. It's a, uh, yeah, you called me the other day and I was kind of surprised to see it wasn't from your phone. It was FaceTime audio. It's like, yeah, sure. Why not? Yeah. I was sitting in my computer and I'm like, I don't want to, you know, I've, I've got a setup at my computer with a microphone and it works great. And why not? So I just, I just do it that way. Yeah. It works well. Um, I will say this, you, although actually, so he's on T-Mobile uh, which means he gets free data and texting in lots of countries and, and France is one of them. So anyone texting your phone number, like friends in the friends or family in the U S text, your phone number, uh, you will get that if you're in the UK, when we went a couple of years ago, and this would still be true if we went today, because we're still on AT and T, um, AT and T does not have free service in these other countries. I don't think Verizon does either, but I might be wrong about that. Um, so we chose at and does have the, you know, $10 a day per line, um, make your life easier and just bring your data and voice plan with you to Europe, uh, option. But if you're going for a couple of weeks, you know, that's 140 bucks a person times, however many people you're bringing, it starts to get really expensive. Right. Uh, so with that, we chose then, and like I said, would would still choose now to get off the plane and in the airport just buy you know a bunch of sims and load them up, and for like twenty bucks you can get enough data to use the whole time you're there. Changing sims changes your phone number. If you're taking out the sim which attaches to your U.S. phone number, save it somewhere. Don't lose it. You will want it again two weeks later. Trust me. Uh, but you know, and then you're putting in this new sim that has a different phone number. Which means anyone texting your old phone phone number or your existing, now it's not old, it's just your U.S. phone number, will not get through to you while you're there. And that can, you know, that can create some issues. So we started making sure we were using iMessage based on email addresses so that at least iMessage people could get to us and we could get to them beforehand, but you know, but while we're there, but we started doing that a couple of months before we left so that any existing message trails that were going were based on email address with iMessage, not phone number with iMessage, because as soon as you remove that SIM and add a new SIM, your phone number is no longer actively attached to your iMessage account in the way that you would want it to be. It'll come back when you put the SIM back in, it's all fine. But while you're there, you have a new phone number. And you, and similarly, you don't want to be initiating chats from that phone number. You want to do it from your email address again so that those chats don't die when you come back. So think about that. And you can make those settings changes right there on your phone. If you go to uh, settings, messages, I am 99% certain. Uh, and then go to send and receive. It'll show all the addresses that you have associated with it. One of them will be your phone number. One of them uh, would be your iMessage, Apple ID, and then any others you've added. At the bottom, it says start new conversations from. Pick something other than your phone number here, and that will help mitigate this. So, so there you go. That's that. Now, as for VPNs, my friend... Um, so here's my thoughts. And I've had this conversation a lot with people. In fact, I was at a user group meeting the other night speaking and somebody said, oh, yeah, but, you know, I, I just make sure that I definitely use a VPN if I'm going to access my bank. Right. And 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 I stopped and I thought, you know, this is really interesting. Your bank is the place where you would need the VPN the least. And here's here's why I say that. You might yell at me, and 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 if you do, great. You know, let us know. Feedback at macgeekgab com. That's where we want to hear about uh, anybody that you know has any questions, comments, or you know disagreements. Right. Feedback at macgeekgab com. Feedback at macgeekgab com. Right. So uh, the connection, the only thing a VPN will do to help you security wise and privacy wise when you're connecting to your bank is it will obscure the fact that you are connecting to your bank, right? What the only thing that's sent in the clear when you connect to your bank is the lookup of where you want to connect to. So, you know, www.bankofamerica.com uh, 
And then the fact that you have a connection to www.bankofamerica.com. Beyond that, because your connection to the bank is secure and mandated to be secure uh, on the bank's end, everything end to end is encrypted, your device to their server. So it really doesn't matter whether you're on a VPN or not um, in terms of in terms of that. You've got a secure connection to your bank and you're good to go. Um, That, you know, that to me is that's why I say, you know, connecting to your bank. And, and that sort of thing is the least uh, concerning with a VPN where you where you do want to be concerned is anything that's connecting in the clear, which is less and less and less um, these days. Right. You, you know, some email providers, you might still be connecting in the clear, but by and large, no, they're all end to end, you know, secure SSL or TLS or whatever. Uh, many websites are HTTPS everywhere, right? So like if you visit Mac Observer, even just to read an article, you have a secure connection there. We did that a couple of years ago and it's just the way it is, the whole site. And of course, frankly, that makes our lives way easier because then we don't have to worry. Well, if you're logging in there for the forums, but that, but you're a premium subscriber, well, that, you know, that account is then tied to your payment data. Uh, that should also be secure. So it's just like, okay, make the whole thing secure. It's, it's just easier that way. And it, and everything supports it. it. You don't even think about it. It's right there. And you can get secure certs from Let's Encrypt if you're a webmaster and you want to do that stuff. But it's a little outside the scope of this question. But um, so, you know, using a VPN, it, it's not a bad thing. Um, it certainly protects you. It adds another layer of protection, but I wouldn't, especially in an Airbnb, I wouldn't freak out about it. So- that's my feeling on this, John. What, what do you think? Am I am I completely mis- misleading all of our our great listeners here? No, no, I agree with you. You know, when I'm out out and about, um, my ISP does offer a secure uh, Wi-Fi that has sure. a certificate and all that stuff. Um, and I think yours does that as well. Yeah, um, yeah, Xfinity does too. Yep. But um, but even if I'm out and about and you know I'm connecting to free Wi-Fi like at the grocery store or the library or stuff, I I don't I'm not too concerned because as you pointed out, almost everybody is encrypting end to end with SSL or TLS, I guess more correctly. And um, I mean I tried this a while ago. I actually you know went to my library and bought my uh brought my machine and got a packet sniffer and monitor the traffic. Yeah. There there was hardly anything. Of interest that wasn't encrypted. Right, right, right. Hardly there was some, anything, yeah. I mean, there was some unencrypted stuff, but it was like printer name broadcasts and like, you know, things just advertising their presence. But I, I didn't see any data where, you know, it'd be like, wow, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, score big. Yeah, right. Yeah. Being able to, you know, compromise the system. You know, I got the uh, the credit card number or the username and password because that's all well protected as far as I know. Yeah. But as you pointed out, you could get somebody that you know, whatever app you're using is a poor implementation, but you would think at the very least Apple would kind of notice that like, uh, Hey guys, um, you're, you're not communicating securely. I I would assume that they scan at least for (laughs) that. Right. They require, although they've, they've, I, I don't know that they've enforced this yet, but they do require that all communication, from your app back to your own servers is done with HTTPS. And, and then when they announced that there was sort of a big issue for podcasters, cause it's like, well, wait a minute, you know, even for my audio downloads, those have to be HTTPS cause not everybody hosts somewhere that that's possible. And, that, and so they, they were like, Oh, we didn't think about that. So, it, but, but in general, yeah. Yeah. Communication from apps, you know, has to be that way. But, but again, even before Apple in long before Apple in, introduced that requirement, banks have had that requirement. Right. And, 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 you know, like we said, most email already does and all that stuff. So yeah, man, it's, uh, that's how it goes. So I, th- I, th- I think you're okay. You know, you, you could find someone that's, very cleverly uh, spoofing a lot of things to get your banking data, but it would take a lot of work. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I, it's, po- it's certainly possible, but they'd have to spoof certificates and confirmations and all of that. I mean, it would be a very robust scenario where, where and it wouldn't just be somebody sniffing on the network. It would be the person running the network. So 
I, 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 I don't think I don't think you need to worry. I don't think so. But if you do, email us at the addresses we said or call us. Um, and our phone number is 224-888-GEEK, which, John, is? 4335. Three, Sweet. And uh, please do visit our forums, macgeekup.com slash forums, that uh, we, would, we would love to see you over there. So it's good stuff. Uh, our thanks to, of course, Cashfly, C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y.com for providing all the bandwidth to get the show from us to you. It took me a lot of years to get comfortable saying those words in the right way together. I just noticed. Anyway, thanks to them. Uh, thanks to you for listening. Thanks to all of our premium subscribers. And, I, and, and you know, I, obviously we, we take a break in every show and thank our, our premium subscribers. But, but I, I want to thank everyone. You know, we wouldn't be doing this show without you. Not only you simply listening, but you engaging, you asking questions, you participating in the forums, you sending in your, your questions or your tips or your comments or your cool stuff found to us, anything. So uh, it really, like, this is a community that uh, John and I are just sort of the stewards of our community. But, but, uh, but you know, it's, we're, we're all doing it together. So it's... It's a great thing we get to do together here, and uh, that is not lost on us every week that we get to do it. So thank you. Uh, and of course, thanking all the folks in the podcast marketplace, of course, onepassword.com slash geekgab, codeweavers.com slash mgg, otherworldcomputing at maxsales.com, smile at smilesoftware.com slash podcast. Barebones software at barebones.com and ring at ring.com slash mgg. LinkedIn.com slash mgg as well. All right, man. What do you think, John? Got any lasting advice for, uh, for our friends here? I think if you're out and about, no matter where you are, you better be using SSL. TLS or VPN. Otherwise, there's a high chance that you will get caught. Made up.